evening and welcome to Tinkering with Edkelar. Last episode I started with the Tektronix 576 Curve Tracer, a late 1960s piece of test equipment for measuring and classifying electronic components. When I left off I had the unit in pieces and just completed the assembly of the test fixture. Now let's look at how things progressed from there. Before I forget about it, I did find a bit of footage when I discovered a loose resistor nestling across one of the test fixture sockets. That could have ended nasty. That particular one has the full or half 115 volts mains voltage across it to power active test fixtures. Now even with the fuse, that can leave a mark. First things first, a good bath and scrub. The parts are at least very dusty, at worst filthy. The bare metal parts clean up well, but the lower parts of the case, which sport the spiffy tech blue, are scratched up. And the paint rubs right off. Not good. Oh well, I found close enough paint before, so I don't worry too much. Now for a dab of paint. The ready-made paint I can buy locally is a good shade, but way too bright. It works in a pinch, but this unit deserves better. So I went to my local paint speciality shop and had a can of custom paint mixed. Way, way closer. It is hard to get exactly right, since any sample I had was already a different shade to begin with. Next, recapping time. 
Like I said, some of the larger power supply caps were already replaced before, so I don't think I'm messing up much by putting in more modern electrolytics. I did check the schematic, none of these are signaling ones, they all are stabilization ones for DC rails, so the exact values are not very critical. After the recapping, there's plenty of switches to clean and potentiometers to lubricate. I thought I could forego the wafer switch disassembly this time, since they are really accessible for Q-tips, but I really wanted to get that old grease out of there, so the shaft and case need to come apart. Interesting, there are ceramic hybrids in there. I did not expect that from such old stuff. Anybody out there who can tell when exactly this became a thing? Another interesting design element are the PCB selection switches. Instead of wafer switches, 
Tektronix used a series of ON switches actuated by a cam drum. That makes cleaning way easier. These drum switches also come in stacked dual versions. Nice! The buttons finally get some disassembly. It's good that there are no components behind them, so I can just take out the plunger without desoldering them. Yuck! Old grease!
and some miniature potentiometers. The PCB mounted relays have the same sockets as the transistors, which I learned after desoldering one of them. The step generator board has a number of TTL ICs on it, all in sockets. Let's pop them out and clean the pins while we're at it. Um, hello? This one I see here is missing a pin. Yikes, it's still in the socket. Clearly this one has seen better days. A good thing that it's just a 74LS00, I got a few of those around. During the information gathering phase, it was pointed out to me that there might be some trouble with the TTL ICs as per a design flaw. There are a few analog inputs routed to the exact IC that was broken on my unit, which should actually be some Schmidt trigger inputs rather than normal ones for stability. And I also lucked out to find that exact Schmidt trigger alternative that is suggested as a mod in my random IC drawer. What are the odds? The horizontal and vertical gain potentiometers are stereo ones. They essentially provide the high voltage supply to the final stage of the CRT driver. I think it's done like this for better symmetry when adjusting. But the disassembly is annoying. At least until you discover that the shaft is just pushed into the rear wiper and can be pulled out with mild force.
the favorite Tektronics silver solder spool. I've heard about it, but this is a first for me. Compensation capacitors in the collector supply are open, but the wipers have gathered some black silver rust. Better give them a good clean, and why not add a bit of fresh grease in the axle while I'm at it? And here's a special treat, the display readout board. On the rear it features a set of ICs. According to documentation, these are custom silicone for exactly this one purpose. Kind of an early ASIC. Now what do these chips do? Let's take a deeper look. Internally, the signal switching is done with the various drum switches. But as a side information, these also set a few data lines to ground or floating. Think of them as digital signals that are either unset or set, where floating is unset and grounded is set. For example, the vertical display selection has a line for 5x and 2x. If any of the ranges that starts with a 2 is selected, the 2x line is pulled low. If any of the 5's ranges is selected, the 5x line is low. For the 1's ranges, both of them are left floating. Now the readout board takes these signaling lines and the ICs perform some custom logic to drive little 5 volt lamps according to the patterns that should be shown. Yes. All these wires from the ICs to the shielded blocks are connecting little incandescent bulbs. Each lamp shines its light into a bundle of fiber optic strands. And those are put into their resigned hole in the front. That means that each light bulb lights up a fixed set of points. The chips use open collector outputs to pull the lamp lines to ground. And now, back to the practical side. With 51 such lamps, I better check that they are all working. And as expected, I found two broken ones. One of them even fell out because the wires disintegrated. Better order some replacement. 
for the readout lamps I could only go with the size as well as the voltage and current rating, so I hope the ones that I found are a good match. And now, assembly time! Let's start with the collector supply. It is pretty much a self-contained unit anyhow, so it's a good way to get parts of the table again. On the side there's two rectifiers. One is for the 1500 volt range, the other one is for the lower ranges. I kept wondering why the supply was so weirdly tucked into that enclosure. The answer is, that collector emitter voltage is not grounded. The collector supply has a different circuit ground than the rest of the instrument. A floating supply as it's called. I thought the insulation was for high voltage protection, but the floating aspect makes it doubly important. Proper assembly order is important here. Some screws are going to be buried once I solder things together again and some solder points are going to be unreachable when the final screws are in. has the transformer so many taps? Let's have a look! The collector supply provides the power for the device under test. Depending on the selection switches, it has to provide AC, rectified DC or smoothed DC. All at a voltage rating from 0V to 1500 volts. That is one huge range that would be a challenge even with modern electronics. To make things manageable, Tektronix used individual tabs for the four voltage ranges. In AC mode, these are directly connected to the output. In DC mode, they are passed through the rectifiers. And when smoothed DC is required, the capacitor bank is switched in, with every voltage tab having their own matching capacitor section. This is what makes this supply a bit extreme on the wiring side. Oh, and to top it off, the DC polarity can also be reversed. There are some resistors in the rear. These are what makes the hard current limit for the supply. When switching the power limit on the front panel, more and more sections of these are put in series with the supply. The 0.3 ohm range just bypasses them. These resistors will heat up, and to avoid damage, there's a thermal cutout on the mounting frame. 
This is the same thing that is usually found in coffee makers and tea kettles. The plan is to start off with the backbone plate that runs inside the instrument and pretty much carries everything else. To finalize the primary side of the transformer, I need the mains cable and fuse block. This is a good time to attach the back part of the case. I pondered painting it, but it cleaned up to almost mint condition and has a nice print on it, so it stays as it is. The assembly process takes a bit of time, because I want to prevent repeats. I need to be sure that I don't block access to a later component or screw location by adding something new. After wiring up the primary side, including the power switch, I connect my variac and bring the input to about 30 odd volts. This allows me to check for sane and proportional output voltages without risking of frying anything, including stagehands. Naturally, the DC filter caps are also part of this equation. The old style caps are not available, but I found suitably sized new ones with screw terminals. I just need to make a set of mounting plates so they don't rely on friction alone. Hmm, darn! One pair of capacitors is quite a bit taller than the originals, so one of them doesn't quite clear the part where the CRT will sit. Good thing I checked. Now I have to shift them one row up and around, including extending some of the wires. And now let's start with the main course, a table of spaghetti. <sighs> the wire loom is looming over the assembly like an ancient monster, but it is the only way to get going again. The capacitors need eyelets on the wires. Normally I'd use solder style ones, but I only had this set of crimp-ons on hand. To make them work, I trimmed them back slightly, used the crimp part to hold the wires in place and then soldered them. Crimping only works reliably when there's one or in a pinch maybe two wires per connector. Here we need to add six or seven of them at times. There's another thermal cutoff switch here. This one turns off the mains input directly. The transformer with its bonkers number of taps is next. I kept the wiring loom as much in shape as I could, so I have at least a good idea of which wire might go where. The final validation is done with the before pictures and occasionally the schematic diagram for cross validation. And also, these two honking power resistors. I wonder what they are for, shadowing? After the caps are connected again, I bring in the rectifier board as the first PCB to go in. AC goes in on the left, DC comes out at the right. and the regulator board on top of that. Connecting the rectified and smoothed DC as an input, the power transistors at the back and the output voltages.
this finishes up the DC supply side to the best of my knowledge. And it is a good time to end part 2 of the series. Note that I don't dare to power it up as it is now, because the rest of the wire loom is still tangled up badly and there's bound to be a short circuit in there somewhere. Again, the actual project is further along, but still not quite finished. I hope you enjoyed the process so far and hope to see you again for the next episode when we will either have a trace or smoke. It is certainly going to be one or the other. See you next time! When I left off, I had the unit in pieces. <coughs> My voice is in pieces. <coughs> Darn it.